Because of that testosterone rise, this is a critical week to be thinking about maximizing muscle gains. All right, we are now in week two of our menstrual masterclass. If you did not listen to or watch week one, please go back and listen to it. We'll make sure that there's a link in here as well for you. From a hormonal perspective, lots of things happening in week two. This is the last week of the follicular stage. So remember last week we were talking about the follicular stage is basically all about the follicle. And when we think about what's happening now, we have at the beginning of week two, we have estrogen reaching its highest peak of the entire menstrual cycle. So if you are a vain woman such as me, <laughs> you can look forward to the natural plumping up of your cheeks and the lips and the brightening of your eyes. It's just like natural filler um, and Botox for you this week. Um, testosterone also uh, reaches a peak this week. It is going to be, and of course, testosterone, very famous for its effect on libido. I often joke and say I am usually kind of coming on to my, my husband. I'm chasing him around the kitchen, the kitchen uh, island. Uh, and, uh, it is, uh, Gio, my, my husband, Gio also always kind of laughs because he's like, oh, okay, I, I know where you are in your cycle now. Cause I'm like, Hey baby, what's up? <laughs> so, uh, testosterone, obviously great for libido, uh, also improves your confidence. Uh, will also from a gynecological uh, perspective, you may find that your orgasms are more intense this week. The sensitivity of your, uh, clitoris might also be, uh, amplified as well. Follicular stimulating hormone, that uh, hardworking soldier from week one, still working hard to develop that one primary follicle that is going to eventually um, release the egg. So we have, um, so we mentioned that estrogen is reaching its highest peak in the menstrual cycle. Usually uh, needs to be, uh, we need to have the menstrual cycle, or, or I should say estradiol rather, um, elevated for call it 50 or so hours. Very, very important that it is raised for that amount. If it is not, then we are going to um, affect luteinizing hormones peak as well. So let's talk a little bit. Let's get a little geeky for a minute around the difference. We talked last week about the when to test and how to test FSH and LH. FSH follicular stimulating hormone, generally pulsed in low frequency, low amplitude pulses, kind of like a water. Like if you just, you know, if you open up a sink and like you have, or, you know, a faucet on a sink, and then it's not quite closed all the way. And you just get that little, bloop, bloop. that's sort of like how FSH is, um, is secreted compared to luteinizing hormone, which is high amplitude pulse, right? Akin to like the sink full blast for a short amount of time. Um, so we have FSH kind of this low amplitude, low, uh, frequency pulses, luteinizing hormone, major high amplitude, uh, very quick meteoric rise. Okay. So back to estradiol, um, the rising estrogen. So we're going to talk a little, we're going to get a little geeky if you don't mind. Uh, and in terms of how estradiol uh, affects the brain, rising estrogen tells the brain, choose one, choose a main follicle to be released. Okay. And so that rising estrogen, and there's another hormone called inhibin B is going to start suppressing follicular stimulating hormone at this point, right? So estradiol rises in conjunction with the developing follicles. But once we have one follicle that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you're making more and more and more estradiol. Estradiol is like, I got this girl. We don't need you anymore. So we start, there's a negative feedback loop, if you will, around follicular stimulating hormone. Okay. Estradiol also primes the endometrium to push out progesterone receptors. Okay. Why do we even care about progesterone receptors? Because we need the endometrium to be thick and fluffy, right? For potential fertilization, pro gestation. So if you don't get your estrogen high enough in the follicular phase and long enough, you may struggle when we get to the luteal phase, when that egg is kind of like, Hey, I'm here, fertilize me. Um, you may struggle with implantation of that fertilized egg. And it'll also obviously affect what your period looks like as well. 
Okay. So I mentioned, uh, testosterone, um, many, many functions in the body, quelling anxiety, hair thickness, volume, body composition, muscle mass. And, and of course that also includes the vagina. So I mentioned some of the gynecological, uh, like some of the clinical symptoms that you may notice, like more intense orgasms, more sensitivity, um, in the clitoris. But if we think about from a muscular and a structural point of view, the integrity of the vaginal wall and some of the contractions that can happen during an orgasm. This is where the muscles of the vagina are, uh, and the, per, and the perineum uh, are contracting somewhere between like 12 and 15 times a second. Uh, so that's also really important for the integrity and structure of the vaginal wall as well. Okay. So we have kind of a lay of the uh, lay of the land in terms of hormones. Let's talk about movement. Some of, you know, we're talking about some of the different verticals, movement, nutrition, uh, and emotional health. First, because of that testosterone rise, this is a critical week to be thinking about maximizing muscle gains. And when I talk about muscle gains here, I mean, specifically hypertrophy or growth of the muscle, right? So with T rising, testosterone rising this week, heavy weights and like the rep range that I usually set out for like hypertrophy type of movement is somewhere between five and seven reps. Okay. So it can still be the same program that you were doing in week one, but now everything is shorter. Like the rep range is shorter and the weights get a lot um, higher. And just as a side note, when we, when we talk about muscle growth, there's, you know, we want to be thinking about a minimum of 10 sets of any given exercise per week of muscle hypertrophy. So if you're doing like three to four sets, let's say targeting any one muscle group, you want to make sure that you're getting back to it at least once, but preferably twice uh, per week so that you're somewhere in that like 10 sets, right? So it doesn't, the rep range is less important uh, when we're talking about uh, overall muscle growth, but because we are in this, um, this week of higher testosterone, we definitely want to be pushing towards heavier weights and a tighter ripe, uh, a rep set rather. And when we're thinking about why this might optimize testosterone, lifting heavy, but not to failure is going to spike your testosterone in the vicinity of 24 hours after a lift session. So if you are in your forties and your fifties, if you're a female in, in her forties or her fifties, you want to be prioritizing muscle group, which you know, muscle growth, which you should be anyway, but then you can see how lifting four times a week, even maybe five times a week is going to directionally be very helpful in naturally increasing your own levels of testosterone. Not to, you know, not to mention that as your muscles grow, you will also naturally produce more testosterone anyway. Um, but this is really, really important. So heavy, heavy, heavy lifting this week, five to seven reps, perfect form, maybe a little break in form is okay, but five to seven reps, maybe get a spot um, and uh, a spotter rather. Um, and and it should be as heavy as you can for those five to seven reps. And then you want to be in, in, in kind of building that out with the muscle growth. You want to make sure that you're coming back to this workout maybe two times this week, like one, one or two, ideally three times so that you can make sure that you can ramp up 10 sets in total uh, so that we can get more muscle growth there as, as well. Okay. Let's talk about cardio um, and the type of cardio that you're engaging in. This is the week where I'm a bit more strict in terms of what types of cardio you should be engaging in. And I think women in general, we've been fed a lie that cardio is important for, uh, it's like the first domino for weight loss. And I think it's important only after you get your nutrition right and after you get your movement patterns right. But generally under the influence of estradiol, under the influence of high estrogen, our ligaments get more lax or kind of loosey goosey and our tendons get tighter. So we are just generally primed for a heavier lift anyway this week, but not so much for burst type of movement. So like things like um, sprints or burpees or anything that you might think of with a, with a high intensity interval training uh, cardio session, we want to generally stay away from that because we know that 
the estro that estradiol peak has separate, like it has those different effects on the structural components of our joints, our spine, our tendons, and our ligaments, right? So low intensity, steady state is the choice here. Um, staying away from hit, I promise you can get back to it next week and you can do it for the rest of your cycle, but just stay away from it uh, this week if you can, please. Uh, and of course, that's just an invitation. It's not a must do as well. Um, all right, let's come back to nutrition. So we've talked about movement, starting off with movement. Let's move into nutrition. So hopefully you're following the Estima diet, right? So this is a female-centric keto, cyclical ketogenic style approach to eating. Uh, and I'll just drop a link for you to find that. Um, and this week, if you have kind of gone through phase one and you're in phase two of the diet, this is a really great week to actually not be in ketosis. Okay. So this is a week where I don't like carbohydrate restriction. I like a lot of carbohydrates and I like a lot of protein. So where as in week one, you might have been doing more of a ketogenic style protein. I usually double the carbs and double the protein, um, this week because of that natural testosterone spike. We want to also, you know, we want to also promote that through our nutrition habits, like increasing or inducing, I should say, uh, muscle protein synthesis, uh, which is done under the influence of uh, an amino acid called leucine. And when you are having uh, it's usually animal products, but you, you can get there with, with plant products as well. You just typically need more of it. So you have to you know, take into account maybe your calories. Um, but we want to be getting like two, at least a minimum of two to two and a half grams of leucine, which roughly equates to like 20 to 25 grams of like a whey protein or an animal-based protein, not collagen, not collagen, whey protein. Collagen is really great for hair, skin, and nails, not so good for muscles. Um, so we want to be having like whey protein, um, there, or you can be having like actual animal uh, proteins too. I'm just thinking about sort of post-workout. You do your lift. What do you do? I like to go and have a scoop of whey protein or a scoop and a half of whey protein. Uh, and then you also want to give yourself your, your muscles some glucose via the carbohydrates so that we are protecting against muscle protein breakdown, which is also like everything in your body is always remodeling. Your bones are always remodeling. Your skin is always remodeling. Uh, your muscles are always remodeling. And when we have carbohydrates, it will protect the, if you're lifting, it will protect the muscles from muscle protein uh, breakdown. And this is where I have to say, and I myself have struggled with this as well, especially in my earlier days when I was first doing keto, insulin is not your enemy, ladies, I promise. Okay. When you're strategic about it, like pairing it with protein, let's say following a workout, um, and even through the day and the week, uh, nutrient timing, you're going to be activating growth pathways to help signal growth in the muscle. This is essential uh, for your thyroid. I mean, insulin is essential for your thyroid, many, many other things. Um, so don't be afraid of the carbs. I would double the carbs, like whatever you were having, uh, last week, you can double those carbs this week, double the protein and like pull down on the fat. So someone might call this maybe more of like a traditional, uh, we'll say figure competitor, bikini competitor, uh, that kind of diet where it's like a higher protein, uh, or like higher protein, call it a uh, moderate carb and then lower fat style, uh, diet. And I outline this in the Betty body book as well. Okay. I want to also want to mention fasting. Uh, this always comes up as well. I am a fan of fasting for women with the same caveat that you have to be smart about it. Okay. So keep in mind when we're in this pre ovulatory week, we have a follicle that's about to release an egg fasting too aggressively this week. And when I say uh, aggressively, I'll say like more, like longer than a 24 hour period uh, of the water variety where there's like no calories can and does influence ovulation. So your ovaries are literally always looking to see whether or not it's okay. Like, is the environment okay? Are we safe? Okay. So if you are, let's say doing a 48 hour fast or a 24 hour fast or whatever, your ovaries might be like, you know, it doesn't really seem like there's a lot of food. Like maybe we shouldn't ovulate this month, right? Maybe we should bring it back um, just to be safe because if she gets pregnant, like we're in trouble because now the baby is not even going to have food. So I don't like fasting 
uh, more than like maybe a um, like a time restricted eating, like a 12, 12, maybe a 10, 14. And that's usually what I, uh, I do that most days. I'm like a 12, 12 or kind of a 10, 14 kind of gal. Um, but I stay away from that 16, eight and, and beyond this week, um, because of, well, I'm trying to optimize for ovulation. So that would be my, my recommendation, um, for you. Okay. And lastly, I want to touch on emotional uh, well-being, mental well-being, because we have all these beautiful hormones, the anabolic estrogen, the anabolic testosterone, you will find your sleep very restful. You're going to, your mood is like a little bit more sparkly. I always say like, you can people again. Um, and I sort of joke being like kind of an omnivert, like I skew introverted, but this week I'm like a switch hitter. I am super happy with people. I love people. I want people around. Um, I want to socialize. Um, you know, in other words, I can adult <laughs> again. Uh, I can people like a pro. Uh, and you know, neurologically, we know that this is true as well. So estrogen uh, will make the motor cortex more excitable this week. So if you are actually starting a new movement pattern or a new program, this is the best week to start it. Um, it doesn't mean you can't start a new program or a new workout, let's say regime, uh, any other time, but this is like the optimal time because you have testosterone and estrogen literally firing on all cyn- uh, cylinders, uh, this week as well. All right. So the only thing I'll say around, so you're going to like be happier and people and energy, and you're going to want to be around people. The only thing I'll say just as a, a caveat, um, and this is more from like uh, maybe experience as well, is you want to treat this extra energy that you have. So you want to see people and you have extra energy. You want to treat this extra energy as sacred energy, okay? To choosing to spend it maybe on what matters the most to you. So last week we had a problem solving situation. We were, we were problem solving with our, with our bleed week. And now our bodies have given us this extra energy. Be mindful about where you spend it. Okay. Your energy, your juices, (laughs) we'll say are sacred, spend them wisely. uh, And in a way that is best aligned with your highest values, whatever um, that may be. Maybe you do need to socialize and get out. Maybe you need to be dolled up and go on a date. Uh, Maybe you do need to, uh, you know, go to a business conference and, and network, you know, whatever, whatever it is. I don't know what the answer is specifically for you personally, but you do, you know what that answer is. Okay. So just be mindful and protective and set some boundaries around your self. Okay. And last but not least, supplementation always comes up relatively consistent from last week. Not much of a change. I was still in the follicular phase. So the athletic greens, the electrolytes, uh, vitamin D, if you can get it naturally from the sunlight, amazing. If it's a gloomy, rainy day or in the, in the throes of winter, then uh, some vitamin D supplementation would be um, appropriate here. And then magnesium and omega threes. Okay. So, and the, so the one thing I'll say is we're going to, so next time I'm here, we're going to talk about week three and four. So now we are moving from the follicular phase to the luteal phase. So a completely different hormonal environment, completely different neurological, emotional time. So we're going to be talking about some strategies on how to help you then. If you enjoyed that conversation and you want to learn more about hormones, check out this video right here. Oxytocin is the opposite. It's the most alkalinizing hormone. So in fact, you can be eating, have a night out eating pretty crappy, but you've been partying with your friends, laughing, you know, had great sex and you wake up and your urine pH is completely alkaline. That's the power of oxytocin. 